senior baseball writer at theathletic.com, studio MLB Network, and host of the great baseball stories at watchstadium.com. Jason Stark joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. As uh, Here we go, Jay. The wild season has begun, right? <laughs> the Phillies are on the clock, Mike. No doubt. They are on the clock. We hear their name everywhere. I mean, it was like the Sixers when they were in uh, the offseason. You know, they were involved with everybody. It was going to be a big offseason. They were star hunting. They ended up with nothing. Is that going to be the Phillies? Are they just going to be involved? Uh, or are there players of high caliber that are actually interested in playing in Philadelphia? <laughs> well, are you talking about two guys named Bryce Harper and Manny Machado? They would be at the top of the list, right? I've heard about yeah. that. Well, Here's kind of the way I read this. If this is about money, if it's about who piles the biggest heap of money in front of those guys, the Phillies will sign one of them uh, because I, I'm totally convinced that they're prepared to just gather up all their loose change and throw it in front of both guys. If it's about other things, then it's certainly possible that they will wind up with neither. They're, look, face it, they are farther away from winning than some of the other teams that will be chasing them. And that's going to be a factor. So I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how this all unfolds, how much they're prepared to offer, how much the owner is driving what they're offering and who they're chasing and how players like Machado and Harper react to it. Jason, for the listeners out there, if you can give them some insight when they see a headline or an article or any type of outlet come out and say, the Phillies have the best odds to land player X and player Y, whatever it is. What, what does that mean? Like, is that just strictly <laughs> – seriously, though, is that just looking at the books and saying, well, they have the ability to sign both? Or, or you know, besides the educated guess, wh what does this mean? Yeah, it's, I mean, if, it's a, if this is just a math problem, the, I mean, the Phillies win the math. If they were to keep everybody who they have under contract right now or guys eligible for arbitration and pay them about what we think they're going to get – their payroll would wind up at about $114 million. That would leave them $92 million under the luxury tax threshold. There's no team with their revenue stream with that much financial flexibility. So there's that part of it. And then the other part is the appetite of John Middleton to reel in a star is no secret. You know, just talking to people around the game. Uh, you know, I had a conversation with uh, one guy this week who said he honestly believes that there's only one team out there among the 30 who could, in his words, go crazy this winter. Guess who? <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about the Phillies right. because of John Middleton. And there's the dynamic between the owner and his front office. Um, that's going to be something to watch this winter and beyond. I, I really think this is a situation where if the owner had a little different attitude, you wouldn't be hearing the same kind of talk from the front office. You wouldn't be seeing those odds that you're seeing in Vegas. Everything would be different. But this owner wants to win, and this owner looked at the empty seats and thought, we need to do something. Yeah, I know uh, a lot of people seem excited about the fact that John Middleton is, uh, I, I guess for the first time, the Phillies kind of have uh, an owner that is out there that you can say, hey, I've seen that guy at Wawa. You know, I've seen him having a Philly pr uh, pretzel somewhere. Before, you couldn't pick any of those uh, what were they called before, like the, the Mysterious Six or something like that? Like you, you didn't know any of these guys. They finally have that guy. They want to spend the money. So my question for you, Jay, is if they were to target one of those guys, let's say two sounds a little unrealistic, but one, which one do you think they would have more interest in, Manny Machado or Bryce Harper? Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt that it's Manny. 
and just because so really? many people in the in this organization have uh, yeah. a long time familiarity with Manny and you know what he's all about, what kind of player he is, where he came from. They know they think pretty much everything they need to know about him. Bryce is much harder to evaluate from the outside if he hasn't if if you if you haven't seen him from the inside. I think there are a lot of teams that aren't a hundred percent sure what to make of Bryce. So I, I don't think there's any doubt that Manny is the answer to that question. Manny's a better defender. Um Manny offers them that positional flexibility because he can start at short, wind up at third, and they they have more maneuverability if they sign Manny because it can lead them to trade uh, Cesar Hernandez. Mm-hmm. It could help them trade Michael Franco. There's easy ways to then adjust the roster if you sign him. It's a little more complicated if you sign Bryce. I talked about this yesterday. You know, everybody talks about Markel Fultz and how bizarre that story is. He's the number one pick. J.P. Crawford was the number one prospect in baseball. The story of this guy seems bizarre to me. Like, no one talks about him. He was, you know, playing third base. It feels like you went from the number one prospect in baseball for multiple years, right, Jay? This guy was, like, two times the number one prospect, too. You never hear his name mentioned. Yeah, he was the Phillies' number one prospect. He was never the—I don't think he was ever the number one prospect in the sport, but he was viewed as a top ten, top fifteen prospect in the sport. And this is very astute of you, Mike, because you know they—they they said all the right things about JP throughout the season, early in the year when he was hurt, after he came back. They continue to to say those things now, but the. The amount of playing time he got told you all you needed to know. Uh, The fact that they were much more comfortable playing Scott Kingry at short over him tells you all that you need to know. And I I can tell you for a fact that they have floated his name and have gotten very little interest back. And that's a that's just not a good sign. I don't know how anybody can explain exactly what happened, but he has made no progress. And if anything, he's going in reverse. Jay, uh, yeah, he's an interesting story. You mentioned uh, Kingery. Um, I guess uh, he would be at the mercy of whoever they brought in and whatever they were able to do. Uh, what about Herrera? Are they at the point where they would call make calls – to see if anybody has interest in, uh, interest in him? Here's what you need to remember. Um, pretty much everybody on this team is potentially available except for Reese Hoskins and Aaron Noah. And so is there a scenario where they trade O'Double? Yeah. Right. I think that's probably unlikely. Uh, I wouldn't say he's at the peak of his value right now. And, um, you know, Matt Clintax said yesterday at the GM meetings that they had a um, – an excellent exit meeting with Odubel before he headed off for the winter and made it clear what they expect from him, what they need him to do this winter, what they want him to do and be next year when he pulls in the spring training. And they're probably going to have to live with that. But here, you know, the other important thing to remember about this winter is they don't have a defined plan because it's so dependent on free agency. You know, signing Manny Machado leads to one set of dominoes toppling. Signing Bryce Harper sets to a, leads to a whole other set of dominoes toppling, which could also include trading a double. And they're in danger of waiting on one or both of them for weeks, maybe even months, and I... I don't know how that is something they can afford to do because they've got a lot of stuff that needs to be addressed. They are not one monster signing away from going to October. 
they have a lot they need to do. They might be one monster signing away from selling some tickets, which is a whole other story. <laughs> Senior baseball writer at theathletic.com, Jason Stark. You can check him out on the MLB Network. I saw John Morosi uh, of the MLB Network uh, mention Craig Kimbrell. This is where I talk about, are we just going to see the Phillies involved with everybody, <laughs> or does that make sense? They didn't have a real closer last year with Kimbrell. They went for a Red Sox closer uh, in the past, and that didn't work out too well. Well, this would be a little different deal, but I don't think that's at the top of their list. Um, impact position player and left-handed starter, uh, those would be items one and two on their shopping list. And somebody like Craig Kimbrell at the money he's going to command would be much further down the list. But they're they're touching base with everybody. And every agent is touching base with them because of all the stuff we've already detailed. They've got money, and they've got a highly motivated owner. Uh, what do you think about uh, Santana? Is he, Are they going to try him at third? Are they going to try to move him? Uh, what's the deal with him? I, I think he's available. I don't know if he's movable without eating a lot of money. So I would guess he's back. But they, they obviously would prefer to play Reese Hoskins at first base as much as they can. Right. You know, the uh, the new Bill James handbook came out, and as I was thumbing through it, you know, they have lots of defense, de- defensive metrics on every regular player in baseball. And Reese Hoskins, ha- ha- I don't remember off the top of my head exactly where his defensive run save total wound up. I believe it was minus 26, but it's the lowest total by any left fielder since they've been keeping track. Wow. And so he tries hard, yeah. but it's just not his thing. He's a fine first baseman. He's a, he's a way below average left fielder. This is a team that was way below average defensively that that didn't have an above average defender at any position and needs to upgrade that dramatically. So getting him out of left field and back to first base would be something they would love to do. It can happen if Carlos Santana is still on the team, but it could happen to some degree where you see some days, depending on who's pitching, where they do what they did in September. Hoskins at first. Right. And Santana at third, where he was actually passable. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to do that 150 times. Which would be interesting if you brought in Machado and still had Crawford and Kingery and couldn't trade Hernandez. Then what? I mean, you just got a whole mess of things, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Let's think about pitching. They brought in Arietta last year. He probably is going to have to slide down the rotation if they really want to have any thoughts of being a wild card or a, a playoff team. Uh, Patrick Corbin, Dallas Keuchel, Jay. They got to get a lefty, right? Do you throw lefty, Jay? I mean, they be, might be interested in you at this point. <laughs> I do not throw lefty, and they are not interested in me. But they're interested in a left-handed throwing human. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and, you know, Cor- Cor- Corbin, Keuchel, I would definitely put those names on the list. Uh, Jim Salisbury floated the names of James Paxton. And Robbie Ray in hmm. trade, I think that's a real possibility. Is they've, you know, they've got this incredible system depth that you would think at some point they're going to use. Um, combine system depth with one of those names we've talked about and trade for a left-handed starter, that's a possibility. I, I think the Yankees wind up probably signing uh, Corbin and Jay Happ which would leave Dallas Keuchel as kind of a fit because he's a ground ball guy, but that's going to be big. That's going to be big money. That's probably a hundred million dollar deal uh, or close to it. Uh, I, I, I just, I think the more effective way to chase that left-handed starter would be to make a trade, but can they decide who exactly they're going to trade until they know how free agency is going to shake out. Right. So these, are, these are questions that we're going to be asking ourselves for the next few weeks. Uh, senior baseball writer at The Athletic. Go to uh, theathletic.com. Spending some time with Jason Stark on the Boardwalk Honda hotline. Uh, Wilson Ramos, he's obviously productive but hurt a lot. Do they have uh, any interest in bringing him back? I think they were intrigued by that idea when he first got there. But I think as 
time went on and they saw uh, all the physical issues that have already taken hold. Oh, I think we lost Jay. Yeah. He's going into the he's bullpen. Right he's got there. to work on his left hand. I was handed, writing uh, down what he was. Yeah, he's working on his. He's uh, working on his biggest he's game. Working on his twelve six deuce right there. Yeah, he knows he can get paid this off season. <laughs> he said, as uh, time went on, they, sh- uh, they, they you know, uh, we're bringing Jason Stark back in. He just vanished. You just vanished there, Jay. Uh, I did not go anywhere. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that as time went on, they started to see uh, Wilson kind of break down a bit. Yeah, just too many physical issues for a guy looking for big money. I. I do think there's interest in bringing in a veteran catcher. Um, you know, whether Andrew Knapp profiles better as depth or a multi-positional type guy who's a third catcher slash first baseman slash part-time outfit or whatever they think he could he could be. Mm-hmm. I don't think they view him as one of their t- primary catchers. So veteran catcher, yes, Wilson Ramos, at what he's looking for. Probably not so much. All right. Uh, you got Pavetta, Velazquez, Eflin. Uh, we never really got to see much um, of Eichhoff last year, but are those guys that they like and view, or do they are they ready to move on from that group? Because it seemed like all of these names that they got at the end of the Amaro era, like every trade they made, Jay, give me an arm, give me an arm, give me an arm. They got a lot of arms. We heard a lot about them. Which guys do they think are here for the long haul? <laughs> Excellent question. Noah. <laughs> Noah's here for the long haul. Uh, Jake Garriott is not going anywhere because he's making $25 million this year. Um, you know, they saw the best of Nick Pavetta and the best of Zach Eflin. And, I mean, the manager has dropped the word star on me in in regard to both guys and what they ultimately could become. But to be a star, you just can't flash ability. You have to repeat ability. And the the consistent dependability of both guys is a question. Uh, Vince Velasquez fits that profile, too. Um, You know, I think that for a long time we felt like all three of them made headway. And then the last two months... We we I, I, we were scratching our head, wondering if anything had changed, yeah. and so I, I think they're symptomatic of what the Phillies have in their arsenal. They have tremendous depth of back of the rotation starters, guys who will pitch in the big leagues, uh, guys who are useful, but not necessarily guys you win with, and they need. A, a left-hander. B, uh, a starting pitcher with greater impact and dependability. Uh, Both those things for sure. And, you know, it sounds good. It's hard to project. And this is a really important winner, I think. They were seduced by what their rotation was for the first half of the season, and they were done in by what their rotation became in the second half of the season. Uh, by the way, uh, Harper, apparently a report said he got offered 10 years, $300 million and said no to that. Uh, would you pay Bryce Harper that kind of money if you're John Middleton? And I asked this question based on, we've had this discussion about the shifts. These lefties, he might be a 320 hitter, but only hits 270 because of the way baseball's gone right now, is he? Do you give that guy three hundred million dollars? Uh, all right. First thing, you recognize how young he is, right? He's 26. younger than Aaron Altair. He's younger than Andrew Knapp. He's basically the same age as Roman Quinn. He and Machado both so young. So yep. if you're ever going to give anybody ten years at massive dollars, it would be one of those two guys. And. I think everybody knows that's the price, somewhere in that range. But in answer to your question, let me ask you a question. Is this a baseball signing or is this something else? That's a great point. If, you know, as if this is something else, if this is about putting the Phillies on the baseball radar screen, mm-hmm. if this is about driving ticket sales and recapturing the attention of the of the market, then 
I, I get it. As a baseball signing, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I like Bryce a lot. I think Bryce is an incredibly talented player who is misunderstood from the outside, who really loves baseball and knows a lot about it, knows about the history of it, follows it. But he has not been a consistently great player in his career. He had one incredible year last year. He had a fantastic second half of the year. Uh, It all adds up to a guy whose floor is bigger than people give him credit for, but who has never realized that ceiling that we expected. Yeah. And it's a really complicated situation. And I wonder where baseball is right now, Jay. Does one guy help you draw? I mean, it almost seems like, you know. Who, who, who's the guy? Oh, it's Mike Trout <laughs> if you're you, here. You, you host a talk show. I mean, you can tell me probably better than I can tell you, but my feeling about Bryce Harper is there's something about him. He's one of those athletes who moves the needle. What do you think? Uh, yes, I think he moves the needle, but I'm not sure. Uh, does he make the Philadelphia fan base come watch him? I mean, I'm 40 years old, Jay. I coach baseball still. I played baseball in college. I played throughout. I love the game. I don't watch baseball as much as I used to, and I don't know that Bryce Harper makes me makes me want to watch. And I'm I'm a huge baseball fan. I, I don't know. I think if if you're going to ask yourself, all right, which free agent who is on the market right now yeah. has a chance to do something every night that makes you say, wow, uh-huh. Bryce Harper's that guy. Oh, I think you're right about that. I'm just wondering. Well, so why do you watch? When why do you go? The, why do, why? When does the novelty, if they don't win, did people say, I want to go still see Bryce Harper? Like towards the end of the Phillies, I think people still kind of said, ah, I'd like to see Utley, I'd like to see Howard, I'd like to see Rollins, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I I, I don't know. Well, I, look, I think that's true of almost any long-term contract. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it has a lot to do with how good your team is and who, who you put around them. And, you know, one of the issues I have with both of these guys is when you sign them, they instantly become the face of your franchise. You know, the face of your franchise right now isn't even a person. It's the mascot. (laughs) (laughs) So things would change dramatically. And that's true. You know, Bryce has been an attraction all his life, but he's never been the face of anyone's franchise. He's never been the face and the voice and the poster child. Not really. Uh, Manny has never really been that guy. He's never been that guy that everybody looks to. That everybody wants to, needs to follow their example. That how hard they play uh, has a ripple effect on how hard everyone around them plays. My biggest reservations about both guys is that it's not whether there's there's ability there or whether they would make you more interested in the team. They will make you more interested if they become Phillies. But there's there's a lot to ask about whether or not they're the right fit. Uh, well put. Jason Stark, his new column at theathletic.com uh, is about bullpenning. This is a very intriguing topic, Jay. Well, it's about how bullpenning effect is going to affect this starting pitching market, which yes. also has an impact on the on a team like the Phillies that wants to sign starting pitching. The uh, quote uh, that you have out on Twitter about the old-fashioned innings eater, the game is changing, my man. The game is changing. <laughs> You noticed, huh? Uh, Jason Stark, check him out at theathletic.com. You can check him out on television, MLB Network, and watchstadium.com. Uh, baseball stories. It's excellent. Senior baseball writer at The Athletic here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Mike. See you, buddy.